NSLP's Guide to Concussions and Mild TBI, Different Ways SLPs Diagnose and Treat Concussion and TBI. Are you familiar with the term invisible injury? This term is particularly relevant to traumatic brain injuries or TBIs. No one can actually see how the damage to certain parts of the brain had led to changes in memory, attention, or even personality. The lack of visibility makes it even more challenging for those with a TBI to navigate daily life. That's why SLPs are so important when it comes to supporting this population. SLPs have multiple roles when it comes to the assessment, support, and treatment of TBI symptoms and outcomes. Join me as I dig a little deeper into the roles of SLPs when it comes to concussion and TBI. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. According to the CDC, up to 75% of people who experience a TBI are diagnosed with mild TBI or concussion. It is believed that this statistic is an underestimate as many individuals with a concussion do not seek out treatment. The Department of Defense defines a mild TBI or concussion as loss of consciousness for up to 30 minutes, confused or disoriented state lasting less than 24 hours, memory loss lasting less than 24 hours, and normal results of a CAT scan. This excludes penetrating TBIs. There is a myth that concussions always result in loss of consciousness, but actually only 10% do. This is Ferry and DeCastro in 2019. Kelly in 2001 notes that although recovery rates can vary, concussions with loss of consciousness usually are associated with longer recovery times. So although an SLP is not typically involved immediately after the concussion, many patients go on to have post-concussion syndrome, which may last a few weeks or months. SLPs play an important role in the screening, assessment, and treatment of TBI, mostly in the areas of speech, language, cognitive communication, and swallowing. That's an ASHA 2016. I had a family member that had post-concussive syndrome and started going to speech therapy at a large regional therapy center. They were working on different naming and memory strategies. I was consulted during the meeting because I'm an SLP, and I immediately wanted to know what specifically they were doing to target the patient's goals that they needed to meet to be able to go back to work. The SLP had no idea that there were specific things the patient had to do to go back to work, and the patient just assumed that the SLP had seen all of that documentation. I know we harp a lot on patient-centered care, but in these cases specifically, it's important to really understand what the patient's goals of care are during this treatment. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't wanna miss. So make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Also, do you have any specific questions about the different ways that SLPs diagnose and treat concussions and TBI? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. While SLPs do not diagnose TBIs, only medical doctors can do that, SLPs do have a large role in assessing the related impairments as they relate to communication and swallowing. SLPs should do a thorough case history regarding the nature and onset of the TBI current and prior to the injury, medications, emotional and mental status, reported areas of concern, and the goals of the family. Also consider a non-speech exam to assess the integrity of the speech subsystems, speech production to assess vocal quality, motor speech planning or programming, speech intelligibility, and comprehensibility. Language, both receptive and expressive skills in oral and written skills to differentiate between dysarthria, apraxia, and aphasia. Cognitive communication, such as attention, memory, and executive functioning, and swallowing functioning of various foods and textures. According to the ASHA practice portal, it's important to consider interdisciplinary collaboration. Many assessment tools overlap, and fatigue is a huge piece with this population. So ensuring that the patient isn't facing repetitive testing from different professions is important. Also consider that patients with TBI may experience depression or anxiety as a consequence of neurological damage or post-traumatic stress disorder. It's important to work closely with neuropsychology to discuss whether it might impact the assessment. Also, it's important to consider side effects of prescription drugs. These can lead to drowsiness or may make cognitive problems worse, which would impact test performance as well. 
Lastly, it's important to document if the patient has had repetitive brain trauma, which may contribute to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, which can impact cognitive and behavioral functioning as well. So it's important to document prior level of functioning versus current baseline skills. A family member that I previously mentioned underwent testing at a large regional medical center and really struggled with completing the assessments. He was exhausted and had a migraine while trying to focus on getting through the questions. He felt as though he really did not do well on the testing at all because of how he was feeling, as well as the poor lighting that was impacting his vision. It's important to keep these things in mind during testing, whether you're performing standardized assessments or informal assessments. It's all important to document. The goal of intervention in TBI is to achieve the highest level of independent function or participation in daily living. Consistent with the ICF framework, WHO 2001, Intervention is designed to capitalize on strengths and address weaknesses related to underlying structures and functions that affect communication, facilitate the individual's activities and participation by assisting the person in acquiring new skills and strategies, and modify contextual factors that serve as barriers and enhance facilitators of successful communication and participation, including development and use of appropriate accommodations. Treatment approaches can be both restorative or compensatory. They may also include AAC or other cognitive communication treatments, including both internal aids and external aids and errorless learning. Treatment may also target social communication, speech, voice, and dysphagia. SLPs may also wanna collaborate with a PT who is trained in oculomotor disturbances to help with treatment planning. It's important to remember that these patients have vision difficulties that can trigger headaches or dizziness if screens are included in therapy. It's important to work closely with the patient on goals that are important to them. Many times our treatments will target impairments that they need to improve to return to work or school. I have a friend that was diagnosed with post-concussive syndrome and presented with orthostatic hypotension as well as oculomotor disturbances. He had difficulty with a lot of the activities that were required of him in speech therapy because reading, writing, and any sort of movement gave him horrific headaches. The SLP did work with a PT and they came up with some ideas on ways to target his SLP activities while keeping the dizziness at bay. It showed collaboration at its finest. We have a free resource for you from the MedSLP Collective all about mild TBI and concussions. Head over to medslpcollective.com to get your hands on this free resource now. The link to the resource will be below.